you're new to these programs, before I do anything, like give you the artist or the title or the date, I just want to give you a chance to look closely at what you see. Um, and one of the benefits of these virtual programs is this is a relatively small painting. Um, and so in the galleries, it's a little bit hard to make out some of the details. So I'm going to give you a moment to just take a look. And when you've had a moment, just tell me what are some of the details that you're noticing? The red hat stands out. The red hat stands out. So this red hat here, right in the center, kind of with the brightest color. Absolutely. Yeah, that was one of the first things I noticed as well. What else do you notice? And don't forget to unmute yourself if you want to chime in. The steeple oh. and it's the tall buildings in the back. The steeple. Was that UK? The steeples in the back and the tall buildings? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're looking at the, the background and sort of the, the architecture that frames the, the scene down below. Yeah, so these beautiful tall steeples here. What else? And the chicken. <laughs> and that the chicken. <laughs> there he is. Did everybody see that little chicken down there? He's super cute. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Yeah. Okay, so we, we have somebody, uh, a gentleman or a boy, two hands on a, a stone looks like a, a rock. Okay, so a figure, yep, yep, so a male figure probably uh, with two hands on some sort of stone or rock, something, somebody at work here. So you're seeing how this ties into my overall theme. And I can tell you what that stone is. It's uh, a grinding wheel, one which uh, someone would use to sharpen a knife uh, yeah. or some other metal object. We used to have one in my basement at when I lived up in New York City because my dad was a wholesale butcher and he would get on this uh, bicycle-like contraption that, and while he pedaled, the wheel would turn and he would use that to sharpen his knives. So that looks very familiar to me. No way, that is so cool. So, oh wait, I'm trying to imagine this, Ingrid. He's pedaling and sharpening the knife at the same time. Does that seem a little yes, dangerous? Because, no, because as he's pedaling, the wheel is turning in front of him. And okay. so he just leans up against that wheel to sharpen his knife. And then there was a little thing above it that looked a bit like a funnel uh, and water would drip down on the wheel as he was going along. Well, that's pretty incredible. I, did you ever, were you ever tempted to play with it down in your basement or was it a hands-off? Definitely. What do kids do? I mean, come on. <laughs> that's you amazing. know what I'm noticing in this painting that I didn't notice before and maybe I'm not seeing it correctly, but in the bottom right hand corner, mm -hmm. it looks like there is a dog with a red sweater. Yeah, I can't see him. Yeah, you know what? And what I've realized is I can actually zoom in on my PowerPoint so I can take us, that's as close as I can get. But yeah, you're right. It almost looks like, it, I'm wondering if he's wearing a red sweater, that dog there. I've never noticed that either. Yeah, I never noticed that before either. But when you were talking about the reds in the painting, you've got mm -hmm. red on the um, chicken. or maybe They got it balanced. Sweater. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the red on the hat. And then this little animal with a cute, in fact, it almost looks like he's wearing a hat too. It, it does right there, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got a dog all dressed up. And while I've, while I've got you zoomed in, I'm going to move over a little bit so you can see a little bit more closely this, uh, this grindstone here. Okay, so wonderful. Lots of things going on. We've got the chickens, the people, uh, the, the man at work here using the grindstone. Um, we've noticed the architecture, and I'll move up a little bit so you can see the, the kind of imposing architecture in the back and then the uh, more dilapidated structure where sensibly these people live and work. Anything else that kind of came to mind as you were looking at this scene that you wanted to draw to the attention of the group? Yeah, the, um, oh, almost looks like instruments of torture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So sure, you're going to a very dark place here, uh, <laughs> calling these instruments of torture, could be. Maybe that they've sharpened or are sharpening, and then the hammer and, um, and the ax. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, yeah, so these seem to be some sort of some blades and I, we right. don't know what they're going to be used for, um, but probably sensibly things that they are sharpening. I think they're getting ready for a chicken fight. Oh, uh, it's easy. Getting ready for a chicken fight. Tell me more about that. Well, I can tell you a little bit because once upon a time we had a, a docent who was retired, he, he lived in this area. Mm -hmm. And I was always infatuated about the dark structure. And then she said, well, that's 
those towers, that's the main drag, that's the town. And this is the shop, it's probably in the same area, but mm -hmm. they're getting ready for a chicken fight. But looking at this picture, <laughs> I really can't see it. But I always point this out to people when I have tours because of the interest that was shown to me. So we have like a dimension, we have the town on the other side, but we don't know what's going on in the barn. Be I, guess, I don't know what the front of the barn looks like. I'm calling it a barn. It could be a it's public it's, building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but she and said I think they're getting ready for a chicken fight. And that was a big thing. Of course, yeah. it's against the and law. We've got, we've got this chicken here. And I actually, there's another one here, um, you know, closer to the to this man. But I think oh, that's an interesting perfect. point that you're, you're really picking up and, and other people have as well, this sort of dichotomy between the architecture and what seems to be sort of the main drag of town. These are more kind of you know, stately buildings and then a barn or something more of a hovel structure. I can't local. remember the name of the town. I'm or not the... sure that I've got it, but I do have a little bit more information about this painting. So it was painted, it's a, it's a Dutch painting. It was painted around 1650. Um, and it's a copy after an original by an artist, Hiborch. Um, and the title is Family of the Stone Grinder. So <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the, the main image here without the, the text, but First of all, what if this is if it's titled "Family of the Stone Grinder"? What clues do we have as to the life of this family? What can we ascertain about who this family is? I think there must be a blacksmith um, a blacksmith operation there because they seem to be um, advertising all of their metal objects that you see in the foreground on either side of the chicken. So. Um, they'd probably have to go to a carpenter to get the handle to put on these uh, metal objects, but they all appear to be tools of some kind or parts of tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a family who clearly are okay. they're laborers, right? Um, and they're doing something, probably producing or, or sharpening these metal tools here that are scattered throughout. Um, yeah, what else? What else? What other clues do we have as to who these people are, what their circumstances? Laura? Yes. This is Don Donna. Hi, Donna. Hi. Um, I, when I saw this, I think the first thing that jumped out at me was the dishevelment, you know, it, the mm -hmm. structure falling down and the roughness of the wood and the decay of the brick and the mortar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in the background, one sees these lovely buildings. But as you get in, it's like all work. We don't sometimes know the sweat and blood that goes into producing things. We just see the big picture. So as we come in and the details start to emerge here with these two men, mm -hmm. we see how hard life is and it's not easy because they, they, they don't look like, well, they could be successful, but they don't appear to be affluent in yes. any way. It's the yeah. place is just uh, shabby, for lack of another term. Yeah, so I like that word shabby. I like the word disheveled that you used as well, and just sort of this element of hard work. And I let me try to zoom in again. We'll see if um, it'll let me do that. My mouse is, has gone away. There we go. Um, so you notice the, even sort of the the crumbling brick, the the wood, and then you're looking too at these people specifically. Um, That's much better. We can see it. Isn't that great? I just realized I could do that on a PowerPoint. <laughs> Zoom in. <laughs> Very helpful. Um, right. So you can kind of see, you know, he's clearly working hard. He's got his, I don't know, my muscles. Is this your bias? What is this one? The one down here. He, that's flexed and, you know, he's clearly working hard. Um, and then I'm curious, what do you make of this, this gentleman in the red hat? This was one of the first things that we noticed about the scene. What is the relationship between the two? Do you? He's the customer. He's the customer. Yeah, that's what I was wondering too, if he is in a customer. He and why do you why do you think shoes. people that think he's the customer? Why do you think he may be the, the customer in this situation? He has fine clothing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his clothing is better. He's wearing white stockings and black shoes. shoes don't appear to be work shoes. That's a good point. Yeah, if you're gonna be in the kind of muck and mud all day, you probably wouldn't wear your white stockings and your fancy dress shoes. Um so he's dressed a little bit differently and, and even the the way he's posed, his posture he sort of seems to be like he's supervising the work in some way. I agree. I would agree with that interpretation. Yeah, and he's so. holding a handkerchief in his left hand, or mm -hmm. what appears to be a handkerchief. So maybe as he walks from the right side of the tracks to the wrong side of the tracks, he can cover up his nose so that he doesn't <laughs> have to smell the poverty. 
It could be if he's a very dainty gentleman, he may need to, you know, <laughs> cover his nose. <laughs> So that, I, I'm curious. So we've kind of circled around this idea of, you know, these are, this is a family or this man at least who is working is very impoverished, um, lives in sort of a disheveled state. But do you take this scene overall to be an idyllic representation of sort of peasant working life? Is it more realistic? What, what kind of sense do you get? What do you think the artist was trying to convey about this, this worker particularly, again, bring have and the have not. Yes. The have and the have not. And right. say more about that. What, how, what sense do you get with the have yeah. and the have not? Well, you have the work area, the mm -hmm. lower part of the picture, the mm -hmm. nice buildings which are well lit are the upper part of the building. So to me, it looks like lower class versus upper class. And the mm -hmm. person who is the customer seems to distance himself away from the worker. Actually, now that I think about it, that's a good healthy six feet of distance. We're all getting pretty adept at <laughs> eyeballing what that would look like. But yeah, you're right. There's a, there's a distance between the two. And then literally here, almost like you have the upper class and the lower class and the way that the painting is divided, you have that kind of literally um, in this composition. Yeah. For yeah, me, it's a normal day in a small town. Mm-hmm. And you know you have the fancy church and the regular people working. Mm -hmm. and they don't know what's going you, on. A, a sort of slice of life. And Ben, Cece, you're wondering what's going on by, behind these doors here. No, I was just saying the people who come up and down that street don't know what's going uh, on behind closed doors. When this maybe the building on the other side looks pretty good, but the backyard doesn't look so enticing. And I don't okay, know if you can so hear the animals. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of part of the town is it in? Because everything else looks very elegant. But yeah. uh, the, it's the artist's surprise, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I like that sort of the behind the scenes of what goes on with the people who are laboring day to day, this sort of slice of life. Absolutely. Um, Don't forget also in those days, the churches were quite rich in comparison to the people living in the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there would be, the church would be quite wealthy compared to a lot of yeah. the, yeah, parishioners. Yeah, absolutely. They better not know. It's best they don't know what's going on. <laughs> they just kind of want to turn a blind eye, maybe, to the the realities <laughs> of hard work. Maybe, yeah, could be. I've got um, and, oh, and you, you, you've anticipated me here, but I wanted ah. to just show you a little bit. And this isn't exactly the same thing because this is a water wheel powered grindstone, um, and it seems as though you know this one would probably be powered maybe by pedals or maybe by water, it's hard to, to make out. Um, but this was just another example that I found uh, to really give you a sense of how this would work. And you see a tool here that could be sharpened. Um, so basically grindstones are usually made from sandstone and they have the pedals that are pumped to rotate the wheel or sometimes they are powered by water. And you use it just the way you would sharpen a knife today um, to sort of, you know, sharpen the blades of whatever tools or knives that you are working on. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is as, as you saw in the, uh, the information about the painting, this is actually a copy after an original. So here's an original and I don't have a great wow. image because I just borrowed this from the website. It's in a museum in Berlin. Um, but this, was, this is the original work. And so I'm gonna just take you on a little zoomed in visual inventory of this painting. And then we can talk about the choices our artist has made um, that are different and why, why the artist might have chosen to, to do those alterations. Hmm. So a di very different scene here. Here we've got a, a knocked over chair. I don't see any chickens, although I've got a cat. Um, right. And then uh, this, this figure looks very similar. This figure does as well. And then hmm. the architecture in the back is a little bit different. Yeah, so I'm going to zoom different. back out. So that's this original here, and then I'll take you back to our painting. So what choices has our artist made that are different from the original and what do you think the effect of those choices are for you? What's inside the doorway? Can we see that? I know. On the oh, original one? Better. No, the one you're looking at. No, not the original. Uh, no. Our picture. What's on the, what's, can we see what it is? This, I almost, like it almost looks chair. like exterior it's, door. I don't know. Well, it looks, like, know. It looks like, a, like a back of a chair. Yeah, it looks like a wheel or something on the outside. Oh, or could a, be. Is that a bench? This That's right bench here? Bench. Yeah. What is here. that? I think it's a, it looks like a piece of stone, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Sure. 
So it's got a lot of detail. <laughs> the family's oh. missing, however. Yeah. The family is missing in the copy. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was occurred to me too. I think the, the woman and the child kind of humanized the, the scene. Yeah. Kind of and balanced it, it too. And yeah, our picture is so much shabbier. You know, the, the one you showed us, the mm -hmm. building is better, the wood is in better condition. Um, and it's not so dwarfed by the things in the background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so some, some really interesting comments here. So we're talking about sort of the condition in our painting. It seems like a much shabbier scene or to use Donna's word, disheveled. Um, and then Mary Christian, there you are, uh, <laughs> mentioned that the, the mother and the child in the original makes it feel a little more humanized, right? Is that kind of what you were saying that you get a, more, a better sense of who these you get a, people are? A, a better sense of maybe the plight of the individuals there. Mm -hmm. uh, that this is just not a business scene going on. There are actual people who live there in these conditions and who have to make a life. Okay. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. And I don't know if you all noticed, but it almost seemed to me like the mother is picking lice perhaps out of the, the head of the <laughs> child. So a really real moment, right, for a parent, especially for someone who's, you know, exposed to that a lot. Um, you're going to have to just do that for your kid. Um, so, yeah, it feels like this really key. That? What's that? Are you able to zoom in on that mother and child, Laura? Yes. That's as far as I can zoom, but. Um, oh, okay. That's yeah, much I thought she was um, doing, it, making, doing a hairdo, but you've uh, put a whole <laughs> different interpretation on that scene for me. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she's just giving her a really nice scalp massage. It's just a moment of leisure for the two of them. That's, that would be the ideal situation, probably. <laughs> People also worked where they lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they definitely. Yeah, which they was worked. really not uncommon for, mm -hmm. um, shall we say, the peasant class back in those days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So which, which of the two versions do you prefer? And you don't have to vote for the Ringling one. I won't be offended. Well, the other one has a little more color. Uh huh. I think has a little more, a little more color. color. Although yeah. it's the same concept, and it's a little brighter. And I wonder too. Some of that might be the the reproduction I'm using, but I think you're right, Cece. I feel like there's these highlights that are um, a little bit more obvious than maybe necessarily in art. Because that is a dark painting. I mean, you could walk right past that in the museum. It's so dark. Mm -hmm. Well, not anymore. Now you're gonna have to seek it out. <laughs> Well, that's why we have you. <laughs> Excuse me, Laura. Excuse me. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Well, why would they copy an original painting? What was the background on copying paintings into paintings rather than sure. photographing paintings? Yeah, so that's a great question. So these, these were both made right around the same time, or about 1650. Um, so what we think is likely because the copies are so close that the artist who made our painting was probably working in the circle of uh, Terborch, who made the original. Um, so they, he may have been in his workshop or a close associate. Um, and so that would have been probably a way for him to learn from the master and by, by replicating the composition, or it could have been really successful. Um, and so he wanted to, you know, try his hand at the same thing. Um, and that's, we see that it's a pretty common practice. Usually for any great master work, there are several different copies by other artists. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty common practice and it would have been done Thank for a number of it. reasons, but it, I think it speaks to, to the sort of stature of the original artist. He was very well known and well respected in his day. So if you couldn't get your original, you could get a very close copy. So it's like a print. <laughs> kind of like a print, yeah. Like getting a poster of like Starry Night and putting it up on your wall. <laughs> you can't have the original. Of course. Thank you. I really like the background buildings in our painting better. I think it, um, it gives a much yeah. greater contrast between the haves mm -hmm. and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. I like that expression. That's a oh. good expression, the haves and the have-nots. I have to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't also, think I'll use it too often. <laughs> I also like this painting because the blue-gray in the shirt and the tools kind of Match gets carried it. over to the steeple. And it's just something uh, about it that, that kind of, yeah. although yeah, they're really yeah. different, they kind of let us see that, that there are some similarities mm -hmm. in the existence. You see that? the yeah. different. 
Yeah, so the same kind of gray, silver, blue tone is in the tools that are being worked on in the shirt of this gentleman and then in the, the rooftops as well. So there's this continuity and even in this sort of wire that's half yeah. covering the window. So it's a, this connecting visual thread and maybe thematically as well. I love that. That's a really interesting take. But is there some like at the bottom of the tower overlooking the roof line, there's a blue, just a tiny stretch of blue that kind of like balances it all out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see the blue there, right there? Right here? Down, come down. This right here? Right there. Okay. So when you look at the blue shirt and the blue and the towers, it has a nice rhythm to it. Yeah, absolutely. You notice in the upper window from say what would be the attic area in the shop in our painting, there's a pole sticking uh -huh. out, which back in those days would have been used to, um, they would have a rope, a winch that would lower down and they could bring up uh, supplies into their barn area. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't exist in the original. So um, there wow. really are a number of differences, or at least not that I could see. And Ingrid, that's an interesting point. It makes me think that the person who made this copy was sort of more intimately acquainted with what a peasant or a laborer's home would look like and sort of the necessities that would be a part of that, that life because mm -hmm. it has that little detail and maybe some others that I haven't even noticed either. Yeah, um, I just realized we, we, yeah, I've just realized we've been talking about this painting for over 20 minutes and I have three others that I want to show you. We've had a wonderful, <laughs> robust conversation, but I don't want to spend all our time on this one. So if there are any last comments or questions, let's have those now and then we'll move to our next work. That expression, working your fingers to the grindstone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there you go. Working your fingers to the grindstone. Yeah. A good way to commemorate our, or start, kick off our tour about labor and work. <laughs> okay. Going once, going twice. On. We'll move to the next one. Um, so I know many of you will be very familiar with this painting, but some of you may not be. Um, and this is a painting that I come back to again and again, and it, continues to baffle me and perplex me and delight me. Um, so even if you spend some time with it, uh, hopefully you will find some new interesting uh, meaning or questions to grapple with. Uh, so my first question to you, and maybe what I'll do is I'll give you the, the whole view and then I'll zoom in and sort of take you through each piece. Um, but what work is going on here? And is this all work and no play or do you find elements of play? So, I'm going to just walk you through this sort of zoomed in version and hopefully it doesn't make anyone too car sick. Um, <laughs> so you can just take in and there are so, so, so many details in this painting and I always find something new, um, but I'm going to just kind of go down and then over. And again, as we, as we kind of scroll through this, it's like the Ken Burns, you know, pan over historic photos. Uh, be thinking about what work you see happening and if you see any elements of play. You see the play. In the seesaw. Mm -hmm. It's not really a seesaw. Well, seesaw. Yeah, but it does look it, like one. It, it looks like one. And then the rope, um, hanging off the rope on the left side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the guy's climbing up the rope. And sorry, I'm not doing this incredibly fluidly, but it's a very long painting, so it's taking me a while to scroll through. All right, I'm going to zoom back out. So we've got some elements of play. This almost looks like a seesaw. They're kind of like bouncing back and forth. Um, I think, Sherry, did you mention this, this rope element over here yeah. with the sort of swinging? And I'll give you a, a zoom in on that one as well. Right. Yeah, they're kind of hanging off the rope. Mother, and what, what, what work is happening in this scene? There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Uh, the, 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 between the two buildings, it looks like people are moving and they're not really like working. It almost looks like they're dancing. So Back I mean, here. I'm sure that's not right. <laughs> it could be. You know what? This painting it does not have a definitive never... interpretation. So you could anyone's guess is as good as anyone else's. Um, so here guess... almost looks like they're dancing, you said. Yeah, well, I don't see them as part of the working group. They seem to be on a different plateau of whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's sightseeing. Because I, 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 I see this picture a lot like everybody else, but I never really noticed the smalls between the buildings the activity mm -hmm. between the buildings. Well, I think that's an interesting point that, that they sort of seem to be on a different plane than other people. There's almost this sort of division of different sections or vignettes that- Usually this is a busy painting. <laughs> it's a very busy painting. 
interesting. Yeah. So what else, what else do you see going on here? I can't know. Uh, in the area that Cece pointed out, it looks like the two men on the right might be whitewashing or putting stucco on that wall because look <laughs> at the difference between the wall on the right and the wall on the left. Ah. And yet, while you do have people working underneath there, you also have what appear to be women and children. So, yes, and having, yeah, having women and children wandering around in a construction scene seems uh, a little on the risky side. Yes. Well, the family that works together stays together. I guess that's the thing. <laughs> We're getting all of... kinds of good aphorisms today. I like it. <laughs> okay, so some, some, some interesting things happening in the middle here. You're noticing the sort of light and dark and maybe wondering if there's some sort of paint or whitewashing going on. Um, what it looks else? so different on this screen. It looks that's like right. a funeral coming on. <laughs> it looks like a funeral. And where do you see the funeral? The, oh, those like four, four guys people carrying. like they're carrying a casket. Yeah, center <laughs> to the right. Oh, mm -hmm. these guys here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, let me zoom in on them for you. Okay, so it almost looks like they're pallbearers. Yes. Yeah. And they're dressed differently. They're, you know. Yeah, like, never, never noticed the dress. Mm -hmm. Very formal. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point, the way that people are dressed, because it's not consistent across one specific time period. Um, if you look, some are dressed sort of in like tunics, some look like they're from the Renaissance, some look like they're from the, the classical or the antique past. Um, so there's a lot of sort of disparate elements that don't seem to quite jive or make sense to us. And that, that's definitely one of them. So we have this little vignette here where they're carrying something, this elongated form that almost reminds you of a, a casket. What else? What else are you noticing? And this is great because I'm finding new things with you as you're bringing these to my attention. What else is going on? What's on the upper right? On the right near the mountains, like look like like they're horse racing or something? Yeah, there's some sort of procession or something with horses and these two particularly look like they were just no, about to take right. off in a Close gallop. The upper right, closer to the mountains or hills. Yes. Oh, back definitely. here. What is that? It looks like there's these people on horses and they are carrying, you know, standards with flags yeah, on like them. Sort of, like you said, a parade of some sort. Mm -hmm. So it's a good. parade or there's some sort of procession. There's no chariot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? I'm struggling with the whole painting. It's just, it's, <laughs> so it's so like, <laughs> like they just plucked the building right there in the middle of, of nowhere. nowhere. And it yeah. just it just Perfect seems now. incongruous for for some reason with what's going on around the building. I would have expected a building like this to have statesmen or mm. you know a, a different caliber of people around it. So I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because we have this building that seems completely finished or almost finished, and it's very you know, palatial, impressive. You would expect statesmen or, you know, people of very high stature to be surrounding it. And a lot of what we see are these vignettes of work. Like these are laborers, laborers, craftsmen. So there's this, there's this disconnect between the building itself, the setting it's in, and then the people who are surrounding it. Absolutely. It, it also reminds me that maybe they're rehabbing a building where the, the, the building on the, le on the right, mm -hmm. the way they're whitewashing it, maybe this is not just the building of a palace. Maybe it's been there a while and they're cleaning it mm -hmm. and getting it back in shape, putting new statues because the statues have deteriorated. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so maybe that this is not a scene necessarily of construction taking place, but they are sort of rehabbing. It's like a this old house, right, episode where they're cleaning up a building that's already been standing for some time and really doing some major renovations. I like that theory, Kay. I've never heard that one before. That's a very My interesting thing. does this, you know. <laughs> so you, you have the inside, yeah, you got the inside scoop onto how this all takes place. <laughs> it almost well, it feels looks like it's a before, during, and after. You know, you've got everything, the past, the present, and the future all represented here by this building. You've got everything from materials being brought to the work site, people working on different aspects of um, the structure and decoration of the building. And then off to the right, you have the kind of activity that wouldn't take place until everything were, uh, were complete. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's not a moment in time it's a progression of time almost. 
Interesting. So that maybe we're not looking at just one snapshot, right? Not like a slice of like life, like kind of we saw in the first painting, but this is meant to be these layers of time, past, present, and future, um, all rolled into <laughs> one complicated Renaissance painting. I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the information here. So this was painted in probably the late 1480s um, in Italy by Piero di Cosimo, a very well-known um, uh, Italian artist. And the title we've given it is Building of a Palace. That's not anything I don't think that the artist originally titled the work or anything like that, but that's kind of what it's been called over time. So yes, perhaps this is a palace, but not definitively. We're not sure. Um, so that's the information there. And this is on view currently in the museum in Gallery 4. Um, it's a quite large painting. A any other kind of little details that stood out to people that you want to point out? If you, if you look on the left hand side of the palace, mm -hmm. you see horses and to me I look like wild buffalo from here. But the, <laughs> you notice they're all one color, whereby on the other side of the palace the people are in different colors on their horses. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure what they're bringing into the palace on their horses. I can't quite figure out if it's, well, it doesn't look like hay. I don't know what they would do. And it looks like they're building something there also. And this you normally can't see because the picture is so large, you would have time to look around. But it's I interesting. Think they're donkeys. Because they, they? Mm -hmm. they seem like they have those, those pack saddles on either side of them, right. these kind of two yeah, you know, I knew it was different the than the other horses. So a very okay, different, so. yeah, very different feel than what's happening on the other side of the palace here, which this is, you know, very, very different. Um, more kind of processional, and this feels more, uh, you know, utilitarian on this side. And the people on the left almost look Asian. Look at the little oh, hat wow. and the way that guy's hair is. The the black haired guy. This man here. Yeah. And this hat. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So maybe not necessarily native to uh, the Tuscany region of Italy. Maybe there's meant to be um, a suggestion of someone ha having traveled to this area. And I think someone else was going to say something and you got cut off if you, who was going to chime in? You know, one thing that always struck me about this painting was uh, while all of this work is going on, if you look through the center of the painting, um, you know, where the one point perspective is displayed. But in the background is this garden that almost looks like an English garden with the very neatly trimmed hedges. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. it just seems so out of place with everything else that's going on. Yeah, and, and that goes back to an earlier comment about how the whole thing seems a little discongruous, like discongruous, because there's the, the kind of lush green landscape, right? And then these very manicured pruned hedges or trees, and then this just sand or deserty kind of feel in the foreground. And then you have the mountains in the background. So yeah, all of these pieces, it's, it's how do they all fit together and what, what do they all mean? And it's and all what, outdoors, Billy. It's all outdoors and it's, maybe it's a training, maybe it's a school training session, who knows? <laughs> that they're all training different arts of, of and Laura, we have a comment. I'm sorry, we have a comment in the chat box as well. Um, Linda Smith shared that the figure on horseback is galloping towards the viewer and gives one a center for the painter. That's from Linda. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Kathleen and, and Linda. Yeah, this, this figure here too, once you see him, he's kind of hard to miss because he's galloping right at us out of the frame. And it gives this jolt of energy to the painting, I think, and, and sort of complicates the story even more. Who is this guy? Why is he riding so fast? Is he coming right at us? Do we He's need to inspector. get out of the way? <laughs> He's the inspector? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. He doesn't know where to start. <laughs> could be, could be. So it's like I mentioned at the beginning, oh, go ahead. Someone was gonna I was just gonna say, it's also the only white horse in the entire foreground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a white horse, and I wonder maybe if there's some significance to that. Um, do we have any other comments in the, the chat, Kathleen? Hmm. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. No, Linda just wanted to share that her mic isn't working. So I'll, I'll pass on all of her uh, comments. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. 
So, so like I mentioned in the beginning of, of when we started to talk about this painting, there are many different interpretations um, and scholars are constantly kind of debating and puzzling over this picture. So I thought I would share a few of the different possible interpretations with you and then you can all see kind of what, what you think rings true. But before I do that, does anyone have a particular narrative that you would ascribe to this painting? If, if you were the art historical scholar and they sat you down and they said, please, you know, tell us, what do you make of this painting? What is this all about? Does anyone have a theory that they want to share? I like your interpretation, mm -hmm. Laura, that the, an advertisement for the Stone, the Stonemasons Guild of Florence. Okay, okay, so potentially, and yeah, we'll talk about that one. That's one that I borrowed from a, another scholar, that it might be an advertisement of sorts. Is Chris going back to work? Any other, any other thoughts before I we'll provide you some other? It's like everybody is in his own little world doing his thing without having to communicate with anybody else. Yeah, it really, I like that. It kind of really feels isolating in a way. Everyone's in their own little world and it doesn't seem like they're diving together, right? There's a sense of separation, which is really palpable, I think. That's a good, a good interpretation. So, Laura? Yes, go ahead. Th uh, th this might be a bit silly, but I don't know if anyone today saw a number of months ago on PBS Masterpiece Theater, uh, there was a dramatization of an unfinished uh, Jane Austen novel that uh, dealt essentially with uh, building a, uh, a seaside community uh, out of nothing to draw uh, the people from London to come down and buy homes and leisure villas and that sort of thing. And as I look at this, it, it, it's almost like where it sits in the sandy desert-like area with the lush mountains on either okay. side that if if you build it they will come you've got the coaches on the right and the burrows and donkeys hauling supplies the tradesmen that are there and as pointed out the lush gardens um it it just it it strikes me as uh, you know if you build it uh, they will come I like that. I like that, right? And it's certainly an impressive building that would be attractive to people. And I, yeah, sort of like the field of dreams of Renaissance Italy, right? Or, or a Jane Austen <laughs> sort of scenario. Um, yeah, that if you build it, they will come. And then maybe it's sort of aspirational in that way. And this, this um, you know, intent to sort of build this city that will attract people from maybe from all over, like Kay mentioned. Interesting. Imagine thing. you live in the 1480s. You don't have any television, you don't have video games, movies, any of the kind of entertainments that we have today. And you are a wealthy family, you invite your friends and family over, you could spend hours sitting in front of this painting, amusing each other with stories about what each person is seeing inside the painting because it's one of these paintings you can come back to a hundred times and still find something you hadn't seen before. Absolutely, so. and that's a great point, Ingrid. And I should mention too that for whatever reason this was made and commissioned, it definitely would have been for a very elite, erudite, educated audience. Um, and they, they probably would um, you know, have, have poured over it for hours and discussed all of the meanings and the implications and the references and the illusions. Um, so absolutely, this is a very kind of unique work, especially for this time when a lot of the work that was made had sort of religious stories or mythological stories. And this is, this is different. And it would have been a conversation piece for sure, as we've just demonstrated, there's a lot to talk about yeah. here. So I'm going to share a couple of different um, potential interpretations of why this might have been made. Um, one theory was that it was meant to be a Medici palace um, that was that was going to be built. This palace was actually never realized was never um, built. But this is the uh, architectural plans for this palace. So you can see it, it's not an exact match by any means to the building in our painting. But um, this was an architect who worked with the Medici family. This was essentially going to be a, a villa that was going to take up an entire block in Florence. Um, so there's some thought that this was sort of a artistic representation of this, this palace that was going to be built for this very powerful family in Florence. So that's one theory. Um, another theory is that it was perhaps this, this painting specifically was one in a series about the um, sort of history of primitive man. So there, there's these other paintings that are similar by the same artist, Piero de Cosimo. Um, and this series is based on an ancient text on the nature of things 
Um, and so we have a couple of paintings that are definitely in this series that they show the evolution of primitive man. And I've got two examples from the Met. So here's a hunting scene. So you see primitive man sort of learning how to, to master beasts and, and hunt. And then the, an, another scene in the same series, return from the hunt. Um, so there's some thought that our painting is a later episode in this series. Um, and in the, the, the quote from the book, from this ancient text, it says, you know, after man learned learn to deal with fire, quote, kings began to found cities and to build a citadel for their own protection and refuge. So there's some speculation that this is sort of represented, um, that's represented in this painting, and it would have been a part of this series that shows the evolution of, of mankind. There's also the theory that Sherry mentioned that this may have been some advertisement for the uh, Stonemason and Woodworkers Guild of Florence it shows their craft, you know, being manifested in many different ways, as well as the result of what, you know, what they could do. Um, and then some people think, too, that maybe it was just a sort of a rumination on the ideal city or the practice of architecture. Um, so Virginia Brilliant, who has written about this painting in her catalog, oops, I'm sorry, um, has, has said, you know, it celebrates both the spirit and the practice of Renaissance architecture or perhaps it is the first structure of an ideal city yet to be built with the palace completed as the workmen labor over the buildings that will surround it. So I think all of those are potentially interesting, plausible theories. Um, and so I'm curious to think, to hear what you think. Do any of those resonate with you based on what you're seeing in this painting here? Or do you, do you, do you dislike all of those interpretations and think there's gotta be something better out there? <laughs> well, I think it's interesting of uh, the theories that you've come up with. I mean, I've just, my mind doesn't think like that. I look at a picture and I look and see what it's all about. I don't really think about the background or the history of it. It's like you pu pull into a parking lot and you oh, I like it here. I think I might like to shop here. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> and I should say, Cece, those aren't my, those are not my interpretations by any means. Those are a number of you know, respected Renaissance art historians and, and scholars. So it's, I'm not taking any credit for those wonderful interpretations. So if you're coming in to look at property, you have this immense piece of property here and then you have the beautiful green background. Mm -hmm. So obviously this was built on a desert floor and it's got options of what you might want to have in your place. Yeah, it could be yeah, a, it could always, a look around. Like advertisement in that way, or like like um, they were saying, you know, build it and they will come, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's possible. Well, I think they would at least come to look at it. You know, I'm sure they heard about it, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of activity here. And it yeah. seems like everybody's got a job to do, which is nice. Exactly. Everybody. And I, I should say, I spent, you know, because I was thinking about the specific sort of the labor, you know, represented in this piece. So I spent a lot of time reading and watching videos about, you know, how, how stonemasons work and how you transport stone and how you split stone and the different kinds of saws they would have used in the Renaissance. Um, and it's really, it's a very accurate representation of that labor happening. Um, and you would have you had see? different echelons of workers. You would have had sort of the, the managers um, and then the, the manual workers and the, the architect, the, you know, the commissioning patron, all of that. And you kind of, I think, see all those different elements at play in this, in this painting. Maybe that's why all the people on the horses are coming in to look it over. <laughs> right, yeah, I think there's that. Take out stonemason workers to work for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is anyone, is anyone on this call a woodworker or a stonemason or a sculptor <laughs> or an architect or a construction worker who can give us some insight about the, the practices being depicted here? Just wanted to ask, see if we've got any experts. <laughs> Okay. I would love to sit down one day with someone who works for like Willis Smith or a construction firm and just say, okay, tell me what's going on here. Like, what are, what are they doing? <laughs> are they doing it right? And what would you, you know, if you had to step in, what would you do? <laughs> There's a bit of a circus-like atmosphere in the uh, painting as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Sort of this resonance, you know, centuries later with what John Ringling was doing on the circus lot. That's a good point. And Laura, um, Dot Flynn asks, did no one notice the small figure in the foreground? We yes. have not talked about the small figure in the foreground. Let's talk about that and then we'll move on to our next one. So I'm gonna zoom in. Yeah, what do you all make of, what do you all make of this, this figure here? Or Dot, what do you wanna tell us about him or her? Well, sometimes the children tell me that it is a child. Other okay. times uh, the adults tell me, oh my goodness, he made a mistake. It's out of proportion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it is what you believe it is. <laughs> I like, that's a good thing. Good motto for art all around, right? It is what you believe yes. in it. 
Right. And that's something that I'm glad you brought that up because as we look, you know, the proportions are a little bit different for each of the figures. Some are very large and, you know, sometimes that makes sense because they're receding into the distance. But this figure here is either a child or a much smaller person. Um, and even the, the two figures on the horse here are quite different in, in scale. Um, so again, just another sort of wrinkle or complication in our interpretation in thinking about the size of the figures. I think the artist had a sense of humor. <laughs> he, he's, he's described, he's described in contemporary accounts as being a very odd person. Like he would boil hundreds of eggs in one sitting to save fuel for his fire and then just eat eggs. Uh, you know, all kinds of little quirky things. Uh, so he, he certainly was an interesting character from what we can tell. I like the books you read. <laughs> <laughs> I know all the, I all the fun facts. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I, like I said, we could we could talk about this painting forever, um, but I want to move on. So we'll go to our next work here, which I already gave you a sneak preview of. And again, this may be a very familiar painting to some of you, or it may be new. Um, and this is again one of my favorites. I bring it up yeah, a lot on tour because there's yeah. so much here. It's a market. It's a market. Yes, yeah, the big market. Yeah. Scene. <laughs> it's so, a great picture. So many details in there. Every single person is different. Yes, and so tell me what what do you see, and maybe you want to share specifically what what details appeal to you. And I, I can zoom in kind of in this bottom portion here to start. But everyone's different. Everyone's got their story. What do you like to return to if this is a familiar painting to you? What little vignette <laughs> is most interesting? I always notice the gentleman telling the other person not to to be quiet. Don't notice what I'm doing. This one here. <laughs> No, to the left, no, right here. The gentleman with his, with his, right here, with his finger to his mouth. Be quiet. Be Don't quiet. tell them I'm probably taking a watermelon oh, without this, paying. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. The children noticed that. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite little vignettes in the painting, too. That always uh, gives me a kick when I see that. And it looks like, Donna, you've got your hand up. What did you want to share? Uh, I almost wish I could hear and smell yes. when looking at this painting because of all of the um, the foods and it reminds me of even our own Sarasota farmers market. Mm -hmm. But in particular, I love the man who's banging his forehead because all of his um, pots and pans and jugs yes. um, are with the horse who's tumbled over and you see all the broken pottery. Mm -hmm. And you know he's thinking, there goes all of my money. Yes. And probably uh, there's a little dog there. Perhaps the dog spooked the horse, or the yeah. horse yeah. lost its balance. But everyone else is going about their business, and within each little vignette, people have different reactions to what's going on right around them. Yes, absolutely. And and, and I think so this is, is so central. Um, not only because it's an, an amusing scene, but also it's this sort of rumination on fortune, right? You know, in, in an instant, he's lost everything. And you've right. got all of these people sort of busily, um, you know, hawking their trades, you know, enterprising, trying to eke out a living. Um, and then, like we talked about in the first painting, as you sort of rise up on the canvas, you have maybe different levels of society and, and you know, that the haves and the have nots in, in some sense, although there's probably a lot of intermingling in this market square as well. And, and Laura, Linda Smith shared uh, that a visitor told her that the man upset about his pottery would say, Mamma Mia. <laughs> Mamma Mia. So if we could hear what they're saying, we could listen in. You might say, Mamma that's, Mia. I could give them all little right. captions. I like that. <laughs> the thing that strikes me about the picture when you get a close up is that everybody is talking with the hands. Mm -hmm. And you just see all of the hands in all of the various conversations. You know, well, I've never noticed Italy. that before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, so this is, a, yes, this is an Italian scene. They're talking with their hands. <laughs> Absolutely, and here's a little bit of information about it. Um, so this is an Italian artist who was painted in about 1750. Um, right, yeah, gestures I think are so important here in contributing to that sense of the frenetic energy and the, you know, the fast paced environment of the market. You get really get that sense from each person. The detail. So, yeah, the detail is incredible. So um, I wanted to talk. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you really don't see people that are um, essentially off on their own. Everyone is 
communicating with someone else. They're either there with someone else or in conversation with someone. So it's a real, it, it gives you a real friendly communal feeling about what market day would have been like back in those times. Absolutely. And I think it's such an interesting contrast to the painting we just looked at, um, where someone had mentioned everyone feels very isolated, that they're, they're in their own little world, and that this is really an antidote to that, right? Everyone is together and interacting, and it, it feels very, very communal. Yeah, when you look at that painting, you can almost hear voices and yes. people screaming and, you know, arguing. That It's very vivid. It's, it's not very just a vivid. painting, it's, it's a live painting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the sense of life is palpable, right? It's just that, that yeah. energy and the, those people. I wanted to talk specifically um, through the lens of, of labor and work, you know, due to the theme of the talk today. There's a lot of different directions we could go in with this painting, um, but there's a lot of information we have about this city. This is Turin, Italy, um, and it was painted in 1756. Um, and this uh, city was known particularly for its, its textiles, its fine textiles. And so you see a lot of women uh, spinning silk. So um, that was a very important industry and we see women engaged in it just as much as men were, you know, in different ways. So here's a, a drop spindle here. She's holding one here in this window. She's holding one here. Um, so <laughs> it's, again, you see these women spinning raw silk and then the, uh, the women who had more training would have made bonnets or been silk weavers or seamstresses. Um, but you see sort of that enterprise represented here. So first of all, do we have any textile artists in the group? Anyone's ever used a drop spindle? Cause I tried to Google how it worked and I was a little unclear, but they're very mm. prominent. Anyone ever used one of those? Okay, no worries. Um, what I also think is so interesting is um, this, this town Turin was a very well documented town. Um, it was an important center in early modern Europe. Uh, from the mid 1550s, it was um, the capital of the Duchy of Savoy and then became the capital of the Kingdom of Sardinia. So you have like a royal presence, a lot of uh, clerical workers, a lot of documentation happening. Uh, and so what I found uh, from just about a century, not a century, a decade before this painting was made um, was a distribution of crafts and main shops in Turin. So this is from 1742. So just about 10 so years before the painting was made. And this is a, a, an inventory of all the work that was going on, all of the different industries people were engaged in. Um, so this comes from a, a, a book, becoming, becoming Poor in 18th Century mm -hmm. Turin. Um, and this chart does not include housework, service industry, or the military or clerical positions, but it includes everything else. And it was such a long table, I've got it cut off. So this is the top half, and then this is the bottom half. But if you just take a look, there's some really interesting things happening here. Um, a cauldron maker, uh, a confectioner. Uh, Nine phlebotomists. Yeah, phlebot nine phlebotomists, a pasta maker, of course, this is Italy. <laughs> An ostrich feathers merchant, I thought was interesting. There was a, there was a market for two of those, uh, two of those merchants. Well, now uh, there's an, an occupation that we don't see today. Yeah, you don't see a lot of ostrich merchants walking around town. <laughs> and then if I go to the, the second half of this here, this is my personal favorite, a crystal and German nice things seller. <laughs> Base powder wow. maker. Um, all kinds of good stuff. And again, you see the silk industry is prominently represented not only in, in the where it says silk here, but in, um, you know, silk cotton makers, silk cloth makers, all those kinds of things. Um, so I thought that was really fun. And you've got a lot of wine porters here, quite a few. So you know this Very was a fun town to visit. <laughs> I did some research on uh, markets in uh, Turin, Italy at, during, at that time and um, found an Italian website on, on actually the city of Turin's website. And so it's all in Italian I, and I translated it on my computer into English, but it talked about uh, these markets were very, very highly regulated, the prices um, and uh, so on, even the, the directions, the streets that the vendors could take to access the market um, were all regulated. And uh, Turin was a very wealthy, um, a very wealthy city um, and more or less the breadbasket of Italy at that time. And um, 
they controlled the prices so that when times were plentiful, um, if there was an excess of product, the city would buy up some of it and put it in storage for the lean times so that they could keep um, prices effectively fairly level for both the vendors and the general public. So uh, while it looks a bit like mayhem when you look at this, um, this painting, these markets were very, very controlled. And yeah, thank you for sharing that, Ingrid. That's really fascinating. And I think it's sort of represented in the way that even just this sort of municipal building here sort of dominates the, the scene. And you have this, um, this event taking place that's been sanctioned by the state. This is a, a lottery drawing. So you can also notice there are some people holding their tickets um, throughout the, the scene. Um, but right, it, it feels like there's this sort of, you know, regulatory or imposing presence overlooking the, the entire market here that you see. Um, I think that's a really interesting facet of, of this, the city life. The other interesting thing is that an image of our painting attributed to the uh, Ringling Museum is up on the city of Turin's uh, website where I researched the markets. They use our painting. That's very they cool. They do. Yeah. Well, is yeah, that uh, cool? Yeah, very cool. We'll have to invite some local uh, Turin officials when this is all over to come <laughs> visit their painting. And then maybe they'll return the favor and let us come visit them. <laughs> Um, other comments about this one, I, again, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I did just want to show you again, because we have the benefit of being able to zoom in. Let's see where he is. So here's a man, like I mentioned, they're drawing a lottery on the balcony there. So here's someone holding a ticket. Um, you've got someone over here with the ticket. So they're all kind of hoping to win. So I thought that was a nice component to the, the, the Labor Day talk as well, that haven't we all dreamed about just winning the lottery and being able to quit our job? And so that's kind of represented here as well. The hard work that's happening and then the hope for a, a way out. <laughs> okay, any last comments about this one? I have one more that I want to show you that I'm really excited about. Just one, one comment. Yes. Um, my, one of my favorite sayings is, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So here you have both hard work and luck. All yeah, absolutely. Together. That's good because we've had a good little expression for each painting. So I'm glad we didn't you know, miss one out for this one. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Okay, now prepare yourselves for something completely different. This is a contemporary piece um, made in 2012. And before I dive in, I want to say that this is um, by the artist Stanford Biggers. And he is very adamant that he does not like to write a lot of label text or explanations for his works of art. He likes to install them and then have the visitors do the work. So I'm going to ask you, what are your first impressions of this work? Because he really wants it to sort of speak for itself. What kind of work is it? This is and really silly. Quilt. Okay, yeah, this is a quilt. It's a photo of a quilt that's hanging. I should give you a little a, context. Yeah. So it's a, <clears throat> so it's cloth. It's cloth, yes, yes. Okay. Um, and sorry, I cut someone off. Go ahead. <laughs> Laura, this is really silly, but if I my, my first glance at it real quickly, it reminded me of a Domino's pizza box, the coloration. <laughs> oh a Domino's God. pizza box. I kind of like that. Yeah, the bright colors, right? The graphic imagery. Interesting. So it feels, it has that kind of contemporary feel for you. With like regular, yeah. now you're getting me hungry. This was, <laughs> Laura, Laura yeah. this was hand quilted, hand quilted. It was, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a, actually an antique quilt that he has then manipulated. Let me show you the, um, here's the, here's the sort of the context here. So it's, the title's not going to give you a whole lot. It's quilt number 12. Um, but yeah, it's fabric treated, ac acrylic, spray paint, and cotton. So the, it's a quilt that has then been decorated by the artist. And it's a, a you know, full-size quilt. Yeah, it looks know. like clouds in the bottom part. So yeah, these remind you of, of yeah. clouds here. Mm -hmm. Clouds and the blue sky. And the, is the, this here being the blue sky? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Very busy. Very busy. OK, what else? Flowers. Quilting, quilting is kind of like an art, and it's very time consuming, labor intensive. Yes. Um, so it would, it would show workmanship as yeah. art. Is this Absolutely, quilt, yeah. Is this Laura, is this a historic quilt pattern in here somewhere? Because each quilt has a historic quilt pattern. 
Really yes, huge. yeah, no, I'm glad, I'm glad we're talking a little bit about the, the sort of the art, artistry of quilting, right? Um, so yeah, this is, a, this is a historic quilt. I don't know the, I don't have the exact identification of the quilting pattern. If we've got quilters on the call, let us know if this is a, a pattern you recognize. But yeah, it's a, um, it is an antique or a, you know, a, an older quilt. It's not something he created in 2012. He took the quilt that was an antique and then added to it. Um, and right, like you said, uh, th that quilting itself is a very laborious process. Um, it's traditionally done by women, right? So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to, to talk a little bit about um, art form and the sort of the gender split and how we traditionally have not valued arts that have been done by women like quilting as much as, you know, the traditionally male dominated art fields. Um, but here you have this interesting um, moment where the quilt's being brought into contemporary conversation um, with, with a male artist and who, who's adding to it. Um, I notice up in the upper left hand uh, one third, you see an arrow, what mm -hmm. appears to be an arrow um, mm -hmm. spotted, spotting. It almost looks as if the arrow has been woven into the quilt with the arrow head exposed on the right hand side. Yeah, and you can almost trace it with your eye and almost imagine that, you know, the, the thread and needle going in and out. It's that same sort exactly. of gesture. Quilts were all traditionally done with rags. I mean, leftover fabric from whatever dressmaking they had, or maybe redoing something. Taking oh, I see. They have a little shamrock in each. Making it functional. Yeah, it looks mm -hmm. like a four leaf. You know, um, how you call that? A four leaf clover, mm -hmm. like yeah. in between the grains. The, mm -hmm. the yeah, these the original part of the quilt. They're almost like a four leaf clover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think wondering what part of this is painted and what part of this is fabric that's been um, appliqued, shall we say? Mm -hmm. I think the flowers were probably painted in that upper left, those mm -hmm. colorful flowers. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that blue yeah. circle it's, it's is the, the upper right. The design, design here goes all the way around. Mm -hmm. And then the little, sh well, I call them shamrocks, but the animals. That's interesting. So what is what is the effect of this for you? We have this um sort of this this pattern quilt pattern, the original quilt, and we've noticed some of the geog you know, the um geometric shapes and the pattern in the original quilt, and then superimposed over that are these cloud forms, these flowers, this sort of arrow, what might evoke sort of the sky. Well, how does that juxtaposition resonate with you? What do you make of this combination of this sort of older art form with this more contemporary looking painting over it? A dream. I'm not dream. quite sure. Oh, and maybe a dream, a dream. You're on the clouds and you're taking a nap and you're dreaming you're on a cloud someplace. <laughs> okay, so it feels kind of like uh, cerebral, ethereal, otherworldly, you're kind of letting your mind go to a new place. What else? It's almost no, like it's really, it's really bizarre. When I look at the flowers, they remind me of anemones. You know what they give uh -huh. them away oh, yeah. uh, during like yeah, Veterans Day and all that stuff. Uh -huh. I'm not sure they're flowers, though. I think they may be gears. They might be what? Gears. Oh, gears. Gears. Oh, gears. Okay. Each other. Interesting. So perhaps, yeah. yeah, and you can almost imagine them turning each other, right? This this gear mm -hmm. area. Um, and Donna, you've got your hand up. What did you want to add something? Um, I love this. And I think it was listening to a Sid Solomon talk that put the idea in my eye of some of his inspiration came from being in a plane during mm. World War II on reconnaissance. But I almost think of when you're in the window seat of a plane, when you can peek through the clouds and the ground looks like a patchwork. Ah. And then sometimes mm -hmm. as we fly yeah. off in Tampa or Sarasota, you see the um, bits of water Mm -hmm. And then uh -huh. as the highways or, you know, the overpasses, you think of all the thousands of people down there. And so it's every little square of the quilt reminds me of activity. And we're looking at it. And as the clouds mm -hmm. come apart and we get closer to the earth, it all becomes bigger. But as we're away from it, it's small. But there's so many little bits. And again, just the importance of um, Mary, I think it was you that commented the labor intensity of making a quilt. And I, I always see the earth as, as that, these quilts and the connections. 
So Anna, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's such an interesting perspective. Take of us being up in the air looking down and how the, especially yes. if you fly over country, you know, farmland and you see the plots of land that have been, you know, yeah. um, you know, called. Um, and I think that's so interesting too, because I think of a quilt and I think of being snuggled under my bed and very kind of safe and grounded. And then you flip your perspective, right? And all of a sudden you're above and you're looking down at this vastness. I, I, I really, that's an interesting interpretation. Um, I know I've gone over time, so I do want to just share a little bit about the, the history and the context of this project with you because I think you're going to really enjoy it. Uh, so like I mentioned, this is by artist Sanford Biggers. He's um, a really incredible artist based in New York, um, but he came down and was the recipient of the Greenfield Prize at the Hermitage here in, in Sarasota. And that's basically a commission to make new work for really like, up and coming exciting mm -hmm. artists. And so uh, the result of his commission was shown at the Ringling in 2012, and this was one of the pieces that he made for it. And the genesis of this project, um, where he started working with quilts, was originally actually when he was commissioned to create work to be displayed at Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia. And that church had been a stop on the Underground Railroad. So he started looking into the history of the Underground Railroad, um, and he was reading about how quilts were used as, as signs for people who were escaping slavery um, to indicate, you know, if this was a safe place or to keep going and in which direction. So he was really interested in this idea of quilts as coded visual language. And he wanted to think about what he could do to add his own sort of language on top of these um, already coded pieces of art. Uh, so you have this really interesting resonance and, and he calls them portals. He says, I consider them between painting, drawing and sculpture and a repository of memory. Um, so he's really thinking about labor, you know, the labor of the women who make the quilts, the descendants of these enslaved people, enslaved labor, um, and how people self-liberated from that and the journeys that they would take. So he's interested in ideas of transcendence and escaping from oppression. Um, and he's representing it so beautifully in this kind of abstract language on these quilts. And I've got a few installation shots. Um, oh, wow. You can see some of his other works. And I love when you it suspended in the gallery like Bob, this. look at this quick and then these um clouds are made of cotton, that of raw cotton. Yes. so again centering it sort of in that um you know the history of enslaved labor and and how people could sort of transcend from that and, and self-liberate um and these what well, cotton which is sort of the symbol of oppression right um and slavery that they become clouds and they sort of transcend and they they elevate mm. Um, I've got a couple other installation shots for you. Interesting. I mean, you Laura, it. I think you're answering Dot's question while you're talking now, but okay. um, Dot added <laughs> on the chat. Um, why would anyone cover this quilt with another design? Okay, yeah, so Dot, so this is, you know, this is part of his project and he's, these have been quilts that have been donated by people who want him to sort of bring it into the 21st century visual vocabulary, make new meaning of these quilts. So I certainly don't think it's meant to be disrespectful to the original art form. And again, this is with the full consent of the, the people yeah. whose, whose families have you know, passed down these quilts. Um, and he's really looking at it as an opportunity to, to elevate and amplify these stories and present them in a new way. Um, so it's not meant to be you know, a disrespect to the, the quilts by any means. But that's a, that's a good question. So seeing, seeing this and knowing all the context, does this change uh, sort of your initial interpretation? And I think I've got, yeah, I've got the image here again for you. Is it any, any sort of new insights or thoughts or questions that come up having a little bit the more? arrows time? become signposts, you know, direction, directional. Yeah, arrows as directional, yeah, sure. Anything else about this and project? the clouds become the, green, perhaps the cotton balls. The little green squares. Mm -hmm. Kind of resemble when you think about the Underground Railroad train tracks. Ah, like uh, uh, train tracks, yeah, yeah. Oh, train tracks. As though the little mm -hmm. green squares oh, almost yeah. are like train yeah. tracks. It's centering it in that Underground Railroad narrative. Yeah, what that's a really interesting. Train tracks. Oh, sure. okay. Sure. I heard Tim Scott, a senator from South Carolina, speaking, and he talked about his grandfather who had to leave school in, in the third grade to pick cotton. And he had, was now the first black congressman and elected to Congress, and he was also in the House of Representatives and also the first black man in the uh, Senate. And he, he summed it up this way. He said, from cotton to Congress 
in a lifetime. Uh, I have found that so moving. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to cry now. <laughs> Well, you know what, Ingrid, I think that's the perfect way to, to end this conversation um, from cotton to Congress in a lifetime, right? And I think that's really that's good, what yeah. Baker's Project is all about, this sort of the possibility of the human spirit to, to rise above oppression and to transcend. Um, so I will leave it there. I know I've gone over time, but thank you so much. You've been a wonderful group today. You've shared incredible insights. I've learned a lot from you. Um, so I hope you'll be able to join us at our next talk. And again, thank you all so much for, for your support of The Ringling and for your wonderful insights. Thank you for doing it. Fabulous. As usual. Thank you, You are a good group. You make it easy. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.